Herzig. I work at LaunchDarkly, and I'm here today to talk to you about speed and safety. Ever since Mark Zuckerberg coined the phrase, move fast and break things, this has become the motto of development teams almost everywhere. Companies wanting to be that next unicorn decided that they too needed to follow this philosophy. The race was on. They needed to do more, more releases, ship faster. Doing more had to be the key to success. Reports like the Dora report confirm this. Elite companies ship 2,000 times faster than low-performing teams. They have 46 times more frequent code deployments. In order to be this elite company, you need to move fast. And it's not just development teams that feel this way. This philosophy has spread across organizations and other departments as well. I once had a CMO that was constantly shifting gears. There was a new top priority multiple times a day. We were told that we were in this phase of throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. Now, this isn't a phase of any process that I know of. This is what happens when you don't have processes. You can easily end up, up, end up in a very uncomfortable situation if that's the way that you're operating. This philosophy of move fast and break things doesn't work for all teams. It doesn't work for all industries and it doesn't work for all people. What has gotten us to this point where we think this is a good thing? And what are the consequences if we can't produce and follow through. In short, we're here because of us. As consumers and end users, our expectations are constantly rising. Take a moment and don't think about yourself as a technologist right now. Think about yourself as a user. What do you expect when you go to a website? Do you expect it to be text only? Do you expect it to load slowly? No, we want interactive, dynamic content. And speaking of fast, those web pages better load as quickly as possible, or we're moving on to the next site. How about error messages? Are you okay when you click on a link and you get a 404 or some other type of error on the web page? I'm guessing if you're like me, that's a no. We do want our sites to always be available. We want them to load without errors. We have to ship quickly because this is what we as consumers have come to expect and demand. We're fickle. If things don't meet our expectations, there's a lot of other sites out there that will. As customers, we're pushing companies, and companies are then in turn pushing on the employees. So we're pushing, and then we're being pushed upon. This is required in order to stay competitive. Being competitive means offering all the things that customers want. That reliability, customized experiences, bug-free, fast, loading websites. When they ask for a new feature, getting that feature delivered as quickly as possible. So as consumers, we want more. And as technologists, we're pressuring ourselves to deliver. And this pressure to move quickly comes with trade-offs. There's consequences when things break. Some of the consequences of moving too quickly without having the right processes in place are things like burnout, high employee turnover, having a high mean time to resolve incidents, releasing features before they're ready, lost sales. None of these are good. We want to avoid these things. I'm gonna go back to the door report for a moment and look at a few more stats. I admit that I did some cherry picking when I presented that first slide. That's common, that's natural. You look for the stats that are supporting your story. So I wanna apologize for misleading you a little bit, but 
This is what we all do. This is confirmation bias. We're looking for the data that supports what we want to say and supports our desire to move quickly. But let's look at the whole picture here. Not only are these elite companies shipping faster, they also have a lower change rate and they recover faster from incidents. So yes, they're moving quickly and they fail, but when they fail, they also recover quickly because they have safety mechanisms in place. At this point, it's important for us to take a tiny detour and talk a little bit more about failure. Failure is around us everywhere, but sadly, we don't talk a lot about it. Failure is seen as a negative. I'm on a mission to reframe failure in a positive way. I want you to eliminate that stigma associated with failing. I'd like you to message me, at me on Twitter, tell me about something that you failed at. Don't be ashamed to admit that you failed. It doesn't have to be an epic failure. Small failures are okay as well. The more we talk about our failures, the easier it is to normalize it and reduce that common feeling that you get when we have a mistake. We wanna be able to learn from those mistakes. So I'm gonna go first and I'll share one of my failures. And the first time I took my driving test, I failed it. You wanna know why I failed it? Because I was driving a little bit too fast. So moving fast can indeed lead to failures. When I think about success and failure, I like to think of them as two different sides of a bridge. On one side of that bridge, you have failure, and on the other side, you have success. But that bridge between success and failure is composed of a lot of things. Primarily, knowledge and learning and understanding in order to get from a point where we're failing to where we're succeeding, we need to be able to learn. We need to look at those disappointments, learn from them, and figure out how to move forward from them. I did learn from my experience. The second time I took my driver's test, I passed, but I may not have learned everything because I still sometimes drive a little bit too fast. A common failure we experience as technologists is incidents. Something doesn't behave the way we expected it, and we need to find a solution. Now, when I said the word incident, who here got a knot in their stomach, or thought, ugh? Or who here is actually working on an incident while listening to this talk? We've come to see incidents, also known as failures, as a negative thing. Something failed in our systems. It's broken. Who's responsible for this? we're looking to solve a problem right away. But what if instead of calling it an incident, we take the Netflix approach and we call them surprises? This slight reframe from an incident to a surprise removes some of the stigma and negative thoughts associated with it. So we didn't have an incident, we didn't have a failure, we were surprised by the way our application responded. We were surprised that that deployment didn't go the way we expected that slight reframe, it might be all that's needed to start accepting failure a little bit more. Now to be successful, you have to be okay with failing on occasion. It's one thing to tell people it's okay to make mistakes. It's a lot harder to create an environment where it is honestly okay for people to make those mistakes. In the book, Team Human, Doug Rushkoff says, human teams should be based on common hopes needs, strengths, and vulnerabilities. We don't get that by enforcing shame, but rather by embracing openness. It takes time to build the right culture. And yes, you're gonna make mistakes along the way as you do that. There are multiple elements that are necessary to create this culture that avoids shame and embraces openness. 
Building that culture will encourage failure, and by extension, it'll allow you to move a little more quickly in a safer manner. The first element you need is a blameless culture. A blameless culture focuses on where systems or processes failed. Instead of looking for a person to blame, there is an honest interest in examining how things can be improved. If you look for and attribute incidents to human error, you're assigning blame, you're assigning shame. That's not what we're looking for. A blameless culture cannot be created without psychological safety. Psychological safety is the ability for people to show up to work without fear of consequences. It means that you feel included, that you're safe to learn, that you can contribute. It is okay to challenge the status quo without being blamed, embarrassed, or marginalized. Employees need to feel empowered to speak up if things are moving too fast, if they're concerned about why a feature is being built, to identify gaps and processes. They need to feel that they won't be blamed when something breaks. Building this requires empathy, open communication, and teamwork. This psychological safety is the foundation of being able to move quickly and quickly recover when things break. One way to create an environment of psychological safety is to eliminate the word why from your vocabulary. This is hard. I know I've been trying to do it myself and I haven't been successful yet. Why is a word that we use quite frequently. There are problem solving tools centered around this notion of the five whys. The problem with why is why is coded for explain yourself. And we learn this from a very young age. I frequently find myself self asking my son, why did you do that? That immediately puts him on the defensive. And that follows through at work as well. I'm trying to change this. Answers to why questions are often biased or it frames your answers to follow on questions. Asking why implies disbelief. It implies that the statement that somebody's gonna respond with is wrong, that there is a right or a wrong answer to that question. Instead, try to ask how or what questions. These promote a more concrete action. But also make sure that you frame that how or what question in a blameless way. Asking things like, what were you thinking? Or how could you make that mistake? Aren't acceptable how or what questions. Now, I'm not here to advocate moving slower. We need to move faster. But rather, I want you to think about what is needed to move quickly in a safer way. You need to provide that value and maintain that competitive edge. But you also need to do this without sacrificing quality and your employees' physical and mental health. The missing piece in all of this is making sure that you have the systems and processes in place to support this way of working. One more trip back to the Dora report. One of the findings showed that elite performers found a better way of working. They have fostered a culture of psychological safety and they've made smart investment in tooling. Now, I'm not saying that buying the right tools, you're automatically going to have this magical culture and it'll allow you to move fast and break things. You need the right combination of the people, the processes, and the tools. Elite performing teams choose useful and usable tools that improve productivity. These tools are supported by processes and safety measures. Looking at some of the technologies and tools in place, they're using things like chaos days to figure out where things are breaking. They're doing monitoring. They're doing load shedding with feature flags. All of these are built in processes that are supported by the tools that they've chosen to use. So what are some of these processes that you can build to better and faster? You need the ability to deploy features without releasing them to everybody. You can do this with progressive delivery. You can test in production, do targeted rollouts or canary launches. 
delivering changes first to small groups of low risk people will help you find problems in a safer way. You can then expand this to larger and riskier audiences and validate the results as you go. Release a feature to a specific group of users based on a set of characteristics. For example, you can choose to launch a feature to all of your internal users or to users at a specific company, or you can do a canary launch where you're giving early adopters access to the feature. The important aspect of this is when something fails, you have the ability to quickly disable it to eliminate that blast radius. That's where these operational pieces come into play. So that build processes covers the moving fast, but things are gonna break. If you're moving fast, if you're testing things out in production, you also need to have operational mechanisms in place to bring your systems back into working order without having to roll back uh, software deployment. You can use things like kill switches or circuit breakers, or I like to call them safety valves. We're talking about moving in a safer way. Um, so calling something a safety valve, if something goes wrong, you can very quickly turn it off um, without having to roll back or redeploy code. Look at service metrics. Measure how new features are performing your key business metrics or performance metrics. If something goes wrong, like take down how many people have access to that feature. Look at being able to change configurations on the fly without having to redeploy things like adjusting your logging levels or rate limiting API calls. All of these can be done on an operational basis to put those safety mechanisms in place when you're moving quickly. Another process that helps you move fast is experimentation. Now, what does it mean to experiment? Looking at the dictionary definition, an experiment is a scientific procedure undertaken to make a discovery, test a hypothesis, or demonstrate a known fact. In other words, experiments provide us with learning opportunities. And as a former teacher, I'm a huge fan of learning. So what is it that experiments in our software deployments can teach us? They can help us learn and gather feedback. They can ensure features are moving in the right direction. A hypothesis is a provable statement that can be measured you can hypothesize all kinds of things when it comes to software. You can hypothesize that adding a free trial button will lead to a 10% increase in signups. You can then test this and see if that is actually accurate. As you get data back, you're confident that you're investing in design changes that make a difference. Using data-informed and data-backed decisions can help you build and release software with confidence. One experiment that we ran was looking at how we loaded our feature flags into the LaunchDarkly main page. When we started, we had all the flags load, didn't have any pagination in there. We started hearing from customers that had a very large number of flags that it was taking too long to load that page. So we decided to add pagination, but wanted to make sure that we weren't helping some customers, but harming others. So we wanted to look at if people didn't have a large number of flags, was pagination going to impact them negatively? So we ran an experiment. We looked at some users that had a large number of flags and some users that had a smaller number of flags and looked at what their page load times were. Thankfully, the experiment showed that there was no negative impact for people that didn't have a large number of flags and there was a positive impact for those that had a large number of flags. So doing that experiment, we confirmed our beliefs and we rolled it out. Had that experiment not gone as well, we would have had to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out what the next course of action would be. Now the final piece to this puzzle, and to me the most important part, is the people. You need to have people who are willing to communicate, that have empathy, and understand the tools and processes that have been put in place. You need people, you need to empower your people to speak up, 
to share when things aren't running well or to share when things are running well. If the people aren't willing to follow the processes that you've put in place to secure safety at speed, the result is going to end up with more failures. So culture matters as you're building out your organization. You need to encourage people to ask questions and question the answers. And that can only be done when they feel safe to do so. Be aware of your biases and how they're shaping, how you're forming hypotheses, how you're running experiments, and how you're building your processes. Plan ahead as you're rolling out features, new hardware. Think about what safety mechanisms need to be in place and communicate across the organization to empower everyone to get involved. Only when you're running safely at speed will you have success. I have some resources in the slides, and if you would like access to these slides or to get a Launch Darkly t-shirt, you can go to this site. Please select DockerCon from the drop-down list, and I will be available afterwards to answer any questions. Thank you.